Now, I will use plain language. I fear that the United States has already decided that when it is ready, it will create a pretext for a war against Iran. That is what I believe. I acquit the Foreign Secretary of being in that hawkish clan, because insofar as one can penetrate the inscrutable um, corridors of power and their inhabitants, he seems to be a bit of a dove. But let me say this too without offence. Britain is a minor player in this game. We've had the debate today as if everything hinged on whether the Prime Minister decided to go to war. The Prime Minister is a minor player in this unfolding tragedy. She decided to go in with the, prime, with the President, maybe because of the transatlantic relationship, the so-called special relationship, as thanks for the Falklands, because she didn't want to get mixed up with the EEC, but she's a minor player. And once she decided, and the Cabinet decided, to commit even a notional number of air forces and uh, RAF regiment, and now the troops, she is locked into what President Bush intends to do. I am opposed to a war against Iraq. I am opposed to action outside the United Nations. I believe it would divide the Security Council. I believe it might not exactly unite the Arab world, but might bring many Arab countries together against us. And I think the outcome of such a war could not be sure, because uh, President uh, Adam Hussein would certainly have the capacity, were he to choose to do it, to destroy so many oil installations that though he himself might be destroyed, it would inflict a burden upon the world economy and the Middle East which could not be contemplated. I believe the sanctions will be effective, but I think you have to set this up against what would happen otherwise. I must also say something else to the House. Without in any way being offensive because governments are not of any colour in any country the main um, um, proponents and uh, practitioners of morality. But to hear the United States, which went into Panama, 3,000 right. people right. were That's killed, right. and uh, to talk about the right of, of uh, international... America That's went into right. Grenada. America supported Iraq, when, uh, supported Iraq when they attacked Iran. America did nothing when... Cyprus was invaded and partitioned by, by Turkey. America has no moral authority any more than any superpower. And the same would be true of, of uh, the Soviet Union about Afghanistan or whatever. Has no moral authority. Nor might I add, because these things had better be said because nobody else has said them, when we're defending the Emir or the King of Saudi Arabia, none of these people practice any democracy, whatever. And I'm not saying they aren't entitled to the protection of the Charter, because I've said it already, but when I think of the denunciations of the breaches of human rights in Eastern Europe by ministers, wouldn't you have expected one of them in this dispute would have pointed out you have your hand chopped off for shoplifting in Riyadh? Are we to live in a world where somehow morality is a product of a parliamentary majority? Now, the real issue is this, and everybody knows it, and nobody has mentioned it. The Americans want to protect their oil supplies. I think I'm right in saying not a single member on either side of the House tonight has drawn attention to what the former Attorney General of the United States, Ramsey Clark, said on the radio last night. He said, we forced Saudi Arabia to accept our army there because we wanted to protect our oil. Now, we are experienced as an imperial power. That won't shock the party opposite. Not ask it to shock anybody. I only ask us to recognize a fact when it stares you in the face. Then there is the arms trade. Now, that has been brought out a bit. I was in Algiers a couple of years ago and I met a former... Egyptian foreign minister who told me they had just had a seminar in Cairo about the Crusades. And during the Crusades, European arms manufacturers supplied arms to Richard Coeur de Lyon and to Saladin. So nothing really changed. <laughs> the arms manufacturers have made billions of pounds out of selling instruments of mass destruction, partly to hold down these colonial peoples so that the, the 
Shakes will supply the cheap oil and partly because it's highly profitable to sell arms. Now, I ask the House also to consider this. If we're going to war and there are those who think we, we might, what are our war aims? Not an unreasonable question. Is it to free Kuwait? Is it to topple Hussein? Is it to destroy Iraqi weapons? Oh, my right honourable friend, the leader of the opposition, went further actually than the Prime Minister in, in setting the objective. Is it to arrest Saddam Hussein and bring him to an international war crimes tribunal? That Prime Minister said that on television. Are you going to sell, send British troops in to fight until you've clarified what it's about? The government has never made it clear. The answer is, it is for the reason I gave. The United States, having helped to arm Saddam Hussein, is determined to bring him down and establish a base. I urge caution, Mr. Speaker. I urge caution because it is not the hardware of military weapons that frightens me. Because a gun can't go off. It is the hatred that makes people want to use them. That is the fuel of war. And in the last month, we've had the most vicious war propaganda pumped down our throat and the temper of peace yes, yes. of which Pandit Nehru used to die, speak. Then. The temper of peace is what we need. We want to be cautious and we want to let it work its way through the United Nations. And for that reason, Mr. Speaker, and it wouldn't have been possible without some help from the Chair, I intend to divide the House against the adjournment yes. motion tomorrow. Yes.